what a fabulous community, guys. I've only been here for 36 hours, and I guarantee you I'll be back. Um, I love your community. Um, I love the outdoors. I got to go out on a mountain bike ride yesterday. Uh, this is a magical place, but what I love most is I'm actually quite puzzled about how you guys have done what you've done around end-of-life care. And I know people come back to Carolyn, and i got to tell you, this is a really amazing place. It does remind me of, of Shangri-La, for those of you that remember the Lost Horizon movie. You know, when he leaves the cave, they instantly age and they die. I'm afraid when I get back on the plane, something's going to happen. <laughs> You guys are really fortunate to have what you have, but I'm not trying to imply that that's by chance or that you're lucky. You've done something special here, and if anything, I want to get the word out to try and figure out how we can get this message to other communities. Because this is a very special thing, and I think the opportunities that sit in front of you, as I was thinking about my slides, if I were to redo some of my slides right now, I'd think a lot bigger than I was thinking. Because I think you guys can think big. And so I'm going to plant some seeds, and I hope help you to think through what you might want to do next. But Carolyn charged me. She said, listen, for the end session, one of the things is they should walk away feeling like, you know, we're going to do something. And even if it's little, even if it's on your plate and it's something that makes sense to you in your little local world, maybe it's having a conversation with your own family. Do it. Maybe it's something big. Maybe it's a partnership that you've been thinking about that you think, gosh, it seems to make a lot of sense. Do it. This is the time. You know, this is not about um, the medical community. One of the coolest things about this conference is that it's about us. And when I say us, it means all of us, our families, the people we love. I bet some of the stories going through your brains right now don't have to do with societal things necessarily. A lot of it probably is about your own family and your own loved ones and your own stories playing about what's happened or what you can envision could happen. And I guess I would share with you that I want this session to be reflective. Um, I want you to keep those stories going um, because I think that's important. That's part of what I want to achieve in this is for us to get even more grounded in our stories than we are because as we develop the confidence in our stories and our instincts, we're going to learn that that's where some of the solutions reside. So The Wizard of Oz is kind of a, as you know, a, a children's story. And in many ways, um, people, when they first heard that I was tying some of this talk, and I've never given this talk before, to The Wizard of Oz, they thought, you know, is that a little superfluous? Is it, am I trying to be funny when this is not a very funny subject? And by the way, the laughing in here, People are amazed when we come out of rooms. I'm a practicing palliative care doc. I work on a team with a nurse, a physician, a social worker, a chaplain, and a pharmacist at the hospital. And people wonder when I'm in these consults, why are they laughing? What could they possibly be laughing about? And the reason we're laughing is because we're talking about life and the absurdities of life and the absurdities of death and all the funny things that happen. And the moment you start laughing about it, people actually start to get more comfortable with the whole thing. So it's actually one of the most powerful tools. Well, I'm not trying to laugh about the Wizard of Oz, but I, I do want us to reflect a minute. Not everyone feels this way about the Wizard of Oz, but for me, I look back on every year looking forward to the Wizard of Oz coming on TV. Because remember, we didn't have you know, VCRs and DVDs and TiVo and all the things that allow us to watch the Wizard of Oz anytime we want now. We had to wait. Do you guys remember this? For the one time a year, when they were going to put it on, we'd go over to our neighbor's house, and they'd bake us fudge cookies, and we'd look forward to it, and we'd all sit around, and we'd sing and watch The Wizard of Oz. I grew up with three sisters, so, you know, this was just part of a boy's life, whether he liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about the values about The Wizard of Oz that really grabs us, and I'm going to talk about that. Part of the themes that I want us to be thinking about as we go forward has to do with those values. I was an engineer for about 10 years before I went back to medical school. One of the advantages of going uh, late in the day on a talk like this is the talks you've already seen have been phenomenal. And in fact, if we all got up and just left right now, I'm good. You guys have so many pearls that I can't prob probably deliver a whole lot more. But that said, I think um, moving forward, what I'd like you to do is try and keep this as interactive as possible. Um, 
I think we have a very interesting community in here. In fact, I'm more pleased than ever that I put this slide in. You guys know how aspen trees work? Yeah, underneath the ground, they're all connected. And these huge groves are all connected by the same system. If there's ever a community where it feels like we're an aspen grove, I mean, this is a really cool community. And all I would tell you is keep your aspen trees growing. Keep that connection strong. Because I think it's the key to weathering the storm that sits ahead. So no napping. If I see you napping, I'm going to call it out. <laughs> we'll embarrass you a little bit. And I want you to kind of lift the eyes and see if you can stay engaged. We're going to reflect on the why about the work that we do. And when I say the work, don't get fooled into me thinking that I'm talking about clinical work. Some of you I'm talking about clinical work. Some of it I'm talking about the work we do with our families, the way in which we engage with our families. We provide caregiving support, the way we have conversations and reflect with the people we love. All of that is part of the why. I'm going to provide some examples of some systematic advanced care planning and some bedded palliative support. We're going to talk more about that. Um, and then we're going to reflect a little bit about some of the, all of the things that we've heard today. I'll try and tie in some of the talks, starting with the best care possible, um, and see if we can walk away with some exclamation points. So let's start with a provoking question. Have we lost our way? There are many of us who've been in this field for a long time that would tell you, boy, if you look at how we were 15 years ago, we're a lot further ahead than we were 15 years ago. And in many ways, we're in a better place. But there are other of us that say, wow, you know, as much as we've made progress, and I think Dr. Bayak made the point earlier this morning, we've made little tiny incremental change. And many people feel like we need something much bigger if we really want to affect the care for serious illness, like many of us believe is possible. Look at some of the things that are happening, the chaos that's right now in healthcare, the politics that are going on in healthcare. I, I turn off my radio now just because I can't, I can't even hear it anymore. It just gets so frustrating to hear what's happening. Hospices around the country, you guys are maybe a little buffered from this, but in case you didn't know, there are huge cuts in Medicare that are affecting their ability to provide the care in communities that don't have the kind of resources that this community has. And in fact, they're discharging patients who are probably appropriate for hospice support because they can no longer afford it. They're being told that they can't have these long stays that we already heard about. Under or unfunded palliative services, many palliative services, and we'll talk about this, exist only because someone had a grant or they had some philanthropy that allowed you to create a program that made a lot of sense. But remember, palliative care is not a Medicare reimbursed um, program. So how you fund it becomes very important. We'll talk about that. Misconceptions and public mistrust, oftentimes not originating from the public. It originates from the politicians who like to twist messages around to serve whatever their needs may be. And so the public appropriately gets really confused. They're like, I don't know what to believe anymore. And so they're left sometimes going to the internet and other things where usually, I don't know about you guys, I just get more confused. We've got an aging workforce. A lot of people that are attracted to palliative medicine and palliative care in the field of caring for people who are seriously ill or geriatrics work um, are older. And they're getting closer to retiring. We don't have enough. Burnout and the list goes on and on and on. So if there's one thing that's going to get us through a tough time like this, and I would say that we've somewhat lost our way, but I hope you hear the message by the end of this is I'm not worried about solutions. I'm worried, if anything, about our energy to sustain ourselves during a difficult time that's coming. And how are we going to have the passion to do the work that's going to be needed to get us through these difficult times? And that comes back to the why. So some of you may have seen Simon Sinek's, um, uh, uh, what's the, the TED Talks. Has anybody, has anybody seen Simon Sinek's TED Talk where he talks about the why? He basically makes the case that some of the most amazing organizations that have ever existed usually didn't achieve what they were trying to achieve because of technology. They achieved it because of the why behind. So they use Apple as an example. Why was Apple so successful? Was it because of the tools they gave us? No, it was because of the ability for Steve Jobs and that group to help us to understand what it meant to live our lives in a different way, in a way that allowed us to connect easier 
in a way that allowed us to, to make sense of something that before seemed so strange to us. And that why I think is important. And I would ask you guys at your tables, I want to just take two minutes to do this. I want you to pick someone at your table. And I just want you to think about today or the work that you're doing. For those of you who are doing hospice palliative care work or caregiving work or being a support for your family or you're working on projects related to much of what we're talking about today, talk about, in a sentence or two, why are you doing this? But I don't mean superficially. I mean, really, why are you doing this? And sometimes when you reflect, you realize it's not as an easy an answer as you might think. But try and dig a little bit on the why. And for those of you who are here from the community, purely because you just want to learn, why are you here? What drew you to be here fundamentally in your soul that brought you to this room? Why are you here right now? Let's just talk for like two minutes. We don't want to make this a long thing, but I want you to engage just a little bit around this question of why. And you can't say Carolyn made me come. All right, you guys, let's take about another 30 seconds to wrap up. Sorry to cut you off. All right, you guys, let's bring it back. So part of the reason I even wanted to spark this question is it's it's been my experience that this question allows us to tell stories. And these stories, much of the time, contain some of the whys. But I've also discovered, I don't know about you guys, the most recent time I had this feeling, I was, I was actually riding my road bike up Squaw Pass, which is outside of Evergreen, where I live in Denver. And um, I was up at maybe 10,000 feet, so I was probably oxygen starved and running out of energy and you know, having one of those euphoric moments. Um, <laughs> But I realized, you know, it was dead still. You couldn't hear a thing, and the, the scenery was beautiful, and it was cold and crisp, and, you know, it was autumn, and, and um, I could just hear my kind of cranks going around. That's about all I could hear. And, and I realized that, that I don't even know why I do what I do. I was a geophysicist for 10 years. I could find oil in your backyard. <laughs> but why, why would I be doing what I'm doing right now? And I'm not actually sure I know. Um, but the why that sits there is really important because in the why sits much of the passion of why we keep doing it when sometimes we run into barriers. Carolyn's had a whole career of barriers that she's figured out how to keep tackling. And it comes from some place in that why. And so I would ask you guys to continue to reflect as individuals, as groups and teams, and especially as a community, whether it's the community here or the communities that you work in in Idaho, around your own why, so that we can start weathering some of the stuff that's coming. <clears throat> um, I would argue that we must never lose sight of it for all the reasons we've talked about, that it grounds our work. It grounds our work actually in the right values. You guys all have instincts. When someone says something that doesn't quite fit or quite work, a lot of times we feel like we can feel that because for some reason it's not aligning with the community values. And I'll say some things today that I bet you guys will say, hmm, that doesn't quite fit us. And that's a good thing. So one of the stories I told recently was around this value of home. Um, and home is an interesting value. As you know, home is a big theme in The Wizard of Oz. After all, it's Dorothy's quest to get back home. Is our home the best care possible? And if that's home, how do we get there? And we heard some great ideas. Ira's already shared a whole bunch of things. And in these other talks, I think you can start to see how they come together to say some of the gaps that we're facing, some of the challenges that we face. So we should think carefully about the why. We should think carefully about our own why. And we should find ways to communicate it. I think your community is actually quite good at this. 
All right, let's see if I can get us to advance. The slides are stuck. Okay. Threats. You guys have shared a lot of threats, and you just completed a little exercise where you had to talk about barriers. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take two minutes, and in a rapid fire, you're going to call out some of the barriers that were at the tables. Okay? And I just want you to call them out in a sentence or a word. You don't get a chance to talk for five minutes. Just a sentence or a word. Anybody, raise your hand. What? Staff, staffing. Staffing. Money. Money. Yes. OIG. OIG. Access. Access. Distance. Distance. A system. A system. Education. Education. Fear. Yeah. Fear. Taboos. Taboos. Denial. Denial. <laughs> By all sorts of people. Lack of awareness. Lack of awareness. Time. Time. Isolation. You guys in the back of the room are killing me because I can't see. Misinformation. Misinformation. Pain. Pain. Pride. Pride. Ooh, I like that one. Attitudes and beliefs. Attitudes and beliefs. Politics. 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 All right. We've named some threats, and the list could go on and on, as you know. Threats, as you know, are just threats, meaning that most of them don't necessarily mean the whole system is taken down. All the work of the past two decades by uh, Dr. Bayak and his colleagues that were really instrumental in getting this field started, it's not all going to go away, but these threats have enormous place an enormous risk on the field to slow it down and to potentially bring things to a halt. And so we have to figure out how can we move away from the lions, the tigers, and the bears and look towards some solutions. Here's a few of the threats. The changing times, are they a friend or are they a foe? And it's tempting to say this chaos right now is killing us. And I'm going to tell you this chaos is the storm that we need. I don't like it but it's the storm that we're going to need to see the opportunity that's sitting right around the corner. And the reason I say that is right now, the fee-for-service world is messed up. The incentives are not aligned with the best care for the people we love. I don't think my system has figured it out. I come from Kaiser Permanente, but what I can tell you is I don't work in a fee-for-service model, and I'm not incented to provide or not provide care. I'm incented to find out who the patient and family are in front of me and try and help deliver care to them. There's lots of other models around the country that do this as well, integrated systems. Your own community has a non-fee-for-service model because of the fundraising that Carolyn and her teams have done around hospice care. The reason those models work is because it allows you to go back to the fundamental why and not be cluttered or incented towards things that are going to drag you away from your why. The changing times are probably good, and I'll talk about why that is. Is this a time to climb into the storm cellar or an opportunity to explore? And I would tell you this is where we all should be explorers. It doesn't mean it's going to feel good, by the way. How do you talk if you don't have a brain? Well, some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? <laughs> One of my favorite lines from The Wizard of Oz. But we're stuck in a world right now where a lot of that is happening. The death panel talk of 2009, one would hope, would finally go away. It's not going away at all. There's still discussions around this is all about rationing. This is all about saving money. This is all just hospice. Palliative care is just hospice. They're just changing the name to pull the wool over the eyes of the public. You guys heard that one? That palliative care is just another attempt to kind of change the name. So what about that? How many of you guys have been in discussions with colleagues or heard discussions around, let's just change the name? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Now, a public, sur a public opinion survey that the Centers to Advance Palliative Care did taught us that 70% of the public never heard of palliative care. The 30% that had, most of them, when they'd heard of it, actually felt very positive about it. 
But there are some people who said, oh, palliative care, that's just hospice. So we actually saw a gamut of people and their responses to the words palliative care. When I hear people saying, let's just change the name, I ask myself, you know, well, what if hospice had just changed their name? Would people think differently about it? Is it just a name change? No, it's not a name change. The reason why hospice care is so valued in this community comes from a very different place. It has nothing to do with the name. It has to do with the values that sit behind care that's delivered in a way that's meaningful to patients and families and brings them the value that they need. Palliative care is the same way. When people experience palliative care, the survey taught us, and certainly people who have experienced palliative care will come back and say, that was just really good medical care. Why isn't all care like that? And that's a perfect definition of what good palliative care looks like. It's good medical care. It's good comprehensive care that supports people in all the ways we want. So I would argue it's not in the name change. We shouldn't be talking about name change as much as we should talk about how do we get to the values that this community has gotten to? Why is it that other communities are so afraid of hospice still and so afraid that palliative care just means another term for hospice? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a minute when we talk about it. But here's some problems that I see. And by the way, I see this everywhere I go, every community I've been in. We use destination language for palliative care. Is he a palliative care patient? Joan's not ready for palliative care, meaning that there's a time where there's a switch. Either you're in it or you're not. And I hear it all the time. Patients don't want to be grouped. I had a cancer patient I was sharing with our table, 30-year-old, who's not feeling too good about his future because he realizes he has stage four lung cancer, 30 years old, non-smoker, completely unfair, and he knows he can't be cured, as we talked about earlier with this group of patients. And he said, the reason I didn't want to talk about palliative care is not that I didn't think that it probably had a lot to offer me, including maybe living better and supporting my family and maybe even living longer, but because the moment I said that I was okay with that, it took me to a different place that I wasn't ready to go to. I wasn't ready to put myself in that group. So it makes you begin to wonder, why do we have to group people? Why can't good medical care just be part of usual care? Why do we have to create a group? And if I could go back 15, 20 years and redo what we've done, I would have never advocated for the creation of the systems we have right now, which is somewhat siloed hospice and palliative care, but instead have worked hard to actually integrate the principles of hospice and palliative care into everyday usual care. That's a real big challenge, but it's, it's important that we be careful with our language. So what I like to remind people is what is palliative care? Palliative care is this extra layer of support. It's support for you and your family that's designed to help us understand who you are. What's important to you? What are you hoping for? What do you fear? Because if we know all that better, we can make sure that the care that's being delivered matches what you want. And notice, I didn't say anything about your treatment. What I'm asking is how can we support you along the way, regardless of whether you're cured or whether you go on to be very sick and ultimately at some point die? How can we be with you where you're at along your journey, taking care of you based on the things that you care about? So here's some of the strange new world that we face, this Accountable Care Act. Is it good or bad? I'm not going to get in that debate with you. We can go out and have beer or wine tonight. <clears throat> the triple aim is a big spotlight. How many of you guys know what the triple aim is? How many of you have heard of the triple aim? So for those of you who have never heard of the triple aim, it's the idea of how do we deliver care that's the best care, it supports the population in the way that provides the best care for the community, and we do it at lower cost. Now you can imagine how hard it is to find triple aim things, but it just so happens palliative care has been shown now in multiple studies to be one of these triple aim things. You talk to patients, they say my life is better as a result. You talk to communities, you have a community sitting right in front of us that can tell you hospice and palliative care has made this community grow in ways that many communities across our country can't even imagine. And what does it do to costs? There's multiple studies that show when you take the time to understand who people are, what they care about, and deliver care towards that, it doesn't cost more. It typically costs less. 
Because people don't have this desire to use technology all the way to the last breath. They realize somewhere along the way technology is not my best friend, that there are other things that are more important. And so us understanding triple aim is critical. Bundled payments. How many of you guys have heard of bundled payments? That's where instead of paying fee for service, you provide an organization, say an accountable care organization, it might be a hospital, that works with all of the community and all of the collaborators to say, we're going to deliver the care for the population with this money. And we can decide how we want to use that money. If we want to go out and give someone a refrigerator, we can. If we want to set up a telemedicine service to where we can Skype in to people rurally, we can. We'll decide how to use the money to serve the patients in the way that makes the most sense to them. To me, we should be excited about that, not afraid of that. Because the solutions then sit in our hands. And we can use our whys to help us figure out what a solution locally for us might look like. Partnerships are going to be the key to the future. And yes, we're not in Kansas anymore, for sure. People that say, well, all this is going to blow by and we'll go back to something fee-for-service, uh-uh. We're headed for a very different world. Everyone should just take a deep breath because it's going to be an interesting train ride. So these are the three things that I've been sharing now for the past few years, both within my own system and when I talk to communities. When people ask me, the question that was asked up here is, what would you do if you were to steer palliative care in a, in a different way? These are the three things that I think resonate with me after caring for many, many patients and families over the years. One is that we need to make sure we have access to people who have the training to care for our most seriously and complex ill, not just in the hospital. Palliative care is pretty well developed in the hospital across the country. But in all the community settings, in home settings, in a variety of different settings, we need to integrate a basic level of palliative care into usual care, in especially high-risk areas. Now, I'm going to differ from some of my colleagues here. While I do believe that you can educate a very basic level, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about embedding a palliative trained certified person. It might be a nurse, it might be a social worker, it could be a team, into a high risk area to deliver care concurrently with the usual team. Why? Because as they work together, if you want to see education happen, that's how education happens. Is when you get to see someone using words that you've never heard before having a conversation with a family that you've never seen before, managing pain in a way that you never could have imagined. That's how you begin to see the spread of everything that we know that's good about palliative support. And thirdly, and I want to talk a little bit about this one today because this is a really interesting one. We need to invest in systematic approaches to advanced care planning. Advanced care planning is not palliative care. Advanced care planning is way bigger than palliative care. It affects everybody. When you're 18 and above and it affects people less than 18, it's about decision making. And so we're going to talk about that one a little bit separately. So I just briefly want to go through those three points. In my own system, and I'm not sharing this again to, to tout Kaiser or anything like that. I'm sharing this because this is the data that came from our own system that I can share with you because I understand it. We did three randomized control trials in different settings, in the hospital, in the home, and in clinic settings. And all three of these showed pretty conclusively that patients and families were more satisfied with their care. They reported higher quality of life. They had better management of their symptoms, a variety of different symptoms. And they were more pleased with their communication. And interestingly, when we measured it, they also used resources differently. They were far more likely to use hospice services and use them earlier. They were less likely to die in the hospital, less likely to use hospital and ICU services. And again, is that because someone's talking them out of care? No, it's because when you provide them support in the way that they're asking for, sometimes it means they don't want to go back to the ICU. And in all three of these studies that we conducted, there was no difference in mortality. So it was about the way which people lived, not how long they lived. Now, you saw some data earlier that's showing in some cases our palliative support actually helps people to live longer. Here's one of the examples of the study. This is called Advanced Illness Coordinated Care. This model came out of Dan Tobin and some work that was done back in the East. And um, Dan teamed with Kaiser to do one of his randomized control trials in the Kaiser setting. And this is basically a palliative trained social worker who works with families to better understand them, teams with the medical team, and identifies their concerns, their hopes, their wishes. How's caregiving going at home? What are some of the things that you could use to help support you? Have you ever talked about advanced directives in your family? Can we talk about planning? And 
went through and basically learned patients and families said, wow, I didn't know this was available. This is really helpful. They reported greater support. And again, what we saw is this social work intervention, just meeting people where they are and talking with people, made people, people made different decisions after they had these conversations. This comes as no surprise to people working in the field because we know these conversations often don't happen like we imagined they might. So in the area where I work, these are some of the palliative care programs we now have. We can meet people in the home. We can see people. We're going to see over 2,000 patients in our hospital this year um, on our very busy palliative care service in the hospital. We have um, several different clinics now where people can come to us to meet palliative teams. And we have several integrated models going on right now where our palliative social workers or other people are integrated into some high-risk areas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. In fact, one of the things I wanted to, here's, here's an example of what this network might look like. And don't worry about all the, the um, initials. They're just different palliative care programs that are trying to support people who might not yet be ready or eligible for hospice, but need this extra layer. Now, your community does a fabulous job of saying, you know what? We're going to really blur that boundary between hospice and palliative care. And we're going to blur it because we don't have all these regulations that we have to follow to a T. That's, the, that's one of the most elegant solutions you could have. But for the rest of us who don't live in communities where we have the kind of philanthropic support that this community has, you have to then start thinking about a network model and how you might create something that would look differently. And by the way, these are all done through partnerships. This is not Kaiser Permanente working alone. We partner with all of our hospices and our hospitals locally. We don't own any of them. We team with them to say, listen, we've got a delivery model that we can do with you and we'll pay you so that it'll help sustain all of your work. And in the process, we'll be able to give our members access to these important services. And by the way, that little green dot is one-stop shop. Because I'll tell you, one of the things we learned is the doctors who were working the system said, wow, there's all these things I can link my patients and families to, but I really it's too confusing for me. And the medical team said, can you help us here? And we said, yeah, we can help you. All you need to, to ask is, could your patient benefit from some palliative support? Could they benefit from an extra layer and if the answer is yes, don't you worry about it. You call this phone number. We'll outreach them. We'll talk with the patient family. We'll come to meet them. And we'll find out what program might best meet their needs. We learned, though, you create these programs. We ran into the biggest barrier that I, I know many of you have experienced, is doctors saying, well, my patient's not ready for palliative care. I'm not going to refer. So we saw patients who probably could benefit enormously from the services having no access. And patients didn't even know what was going on. They didn't know this gatekeeping was going on where doctors are making decisions about what support they may or may not need without even having the ability to share their stories so that someone might be able to assess it. And you can see some of the reasons why. It wouldn't be well, well received when they talk to, to doctors. It's someone else's job. Um, I don't really have time. Um, and it didn't really occur to me to, to have these types of conversations. You can see there's all sorts of different barriers. So one might ask themselves is, why do we develop a system where there has to be this gatekeeping that's going on as to someone deciding when someone's right for palliative care or not? Because we might worry about a system like that as a former engineer. I'm not sure I want a system that's allowing that individual process to occur without going back to fundamentally, what is it that patients and families want and need, and asking them because that might be the best system of all. So how could we create a system where palliative support is part of usual care? And I want you guys to think about this with me. I'll give you an example of one of the things we did. We said, listen, what would it be like if one of the high-risk areas that um, for those of us working in medicine that we'll sometimes see patients in is called long-term acute care. Long-term acute care, especially in the metropolitan areas, is people who come from the hospital who are very, very sick. They're often on ventilators. And the idea is to get them off of the ventilator in the hospital, but they don't come off of the ventilator. We've heard stories like this before. Or they have really complex wounds. Or they have care that's so intense that even a nursing home can't care for them. And so they go to these long-term acute care settings. Do you think a patient and family facing these types of challenges might have some palliative needs? One would think that's probably highly likely. Well, at baseline, about 10% of patients were being referred for any palliative support. And that seemed kind of low to us and kind of surprising. And we knew all of these barriers existed. So we said, what if we created a model where instead of waiting for palliative support, we just embedded palliative support as part of usual care 
And so we brought a nursing in, into the long-term acute care. We brought a social worker into that model and access to a nurse and a chaplain that were all palliative trained. And we said, instead of waiting for referrals, we're going to see everybody. We're not going to provide support for everybody unless they need support. But we're going to sit down with the family and we're going to find out what their needs are. And if they need support, we're going to provide it. And if they don't need support, we're going to support them during that meeting and we're going to move on. This is some of the things that the social worker was doing. Talking about goals of care, understanding what they understood about their illness and what questions they might have. Being able to support them around their care planning. Finding out what's happening at home so that you can prepare ahead and evaluate them for needs that might require more ongoing support. And this is a fancy graph just to show that you can see at the baseline over on, the, um, on your uh, left is where the curve was for people receiving palliative support. You can see it was quite low. As soon as the pilot started, you can see that blue curve jumps up rapidly. That's the pilot in the, in the location where we did this intervention compared to the control which was in the red. So you can see that as we go forward, I'm going to compare what happened at that control site versus what happened at that pilot site. So the blue is the pilot site, and this is what members, our patients, told us. Is they said, communication was far better. They more often had information to help them understand their illness. They more often understood their treatment options. They more often felt the team worked together to take care of them. They felt more often the team explained what to expect from their illness. They described these other things that you can see. The last one I love, how often did the team help you and your family with the things that worry you most? You can see, and by the way, this went statistically significant for those of you who are statisticians or care about the research behind this. This went statistically significant within 15 patients. Just adding a social worker and not being afraid to have these conversations and provide this support was dramatically important to patients and families. We also saw many people went on to get ongoing support. You can see 71% versus 13% at the control sites. The support was much quicker. That a healthcare agent, a proxy, was identified 93% of the time versus at baseline only 33%. You can see the uh, election of resuscitation. I think we heard earlier from, um, you know, that, that people make different decisions when they actually understand um, the data and more likely to choose uh, comfort care or hospice at death. And then importantly, that last line I include because people say, well, how can you afford to put a social worker in this role? And the last one explains how can you afford not to put a social worker in this role? And this answers the question of how communities can figure out how to do this because they're going to partner with hospitals to, to, to make this. But, but probably more importantly, I want you to see this. This is one of the members who received the, who received the support. My name is Connie Henry. Um, I have been hospitalized for a year and about a week, week and a half. The first person I met was Dana. And you were great. I felt you were somebody I could trust. And you, you always check up on me. And I appreciate that. Probably more than you'll ever know. And Mr. Brian, what can I say? You've been so easy to talk to. You come in. And I might have been feeling down. But then when we get talking, you say I lift you up. You lift me up too. You know, it is, it's a very nice thing to have people like Dana and Brian to come in and you can share with them and they'll, they're there for you. You feel like you got somebody on your side. Occasionally I'll hear people say, you know, palliative care, it's, it's really touchy-feely. And I think of my own career, you know, I was in an incredibly technical position and I came to medicine thinking, and I grew up with three sisters, so they, they grounded me in values whether I liked it or not. And, and I came to medicine thinking it was going to be an incredibly um, emotionally satisfying, compassionate science. And part of the reason I ended up where I was is because I was shocked at what I was seeing 
that in fact it felt so disconnected at times. And this video reminds me of the, the why of the work we do sits there. And, and when we focus on the why and bringing the why into the care that we're delivering, we see amazingly different things. This should not surprise us at all. I recently was at a talk that I, I wanted to share this with you. This is a mattering map. If you recognize this for some of you who remember reading this to your children, or if you're like me, I still read this. This is Winnie the Pooh. And this is the front cover of Winnie the Pooh. And this is Christopher Robin's mattering map. And what I mean by that, I love this statement. We commonly think in medicine about what's the matter with you? And in fact, the question that we want to ask is help us to know what matters to you. And the mattering map is Christopher Robin's expression of where the woozles weren't and um, Pooh's thinking spot. All these things that were important for Christopher Robin to be able to tell their story. The sign of a good palliative care meeting is when we walk out having some sense of what the mattering map looks like. Because the moment I can see their map, I, our teams can be awfully creative with the primary teams to figure out solutions that make sense to them. That's what this is all about. Here's another example of targeted support. For those of you who are in communities that maybe aren't as blessed as Sun Valley here, um, Many of you might be familiar with the Hospice at Michigan's at-home support program. They basically started through some grants, but then they quickly partnered with some health plans, some insurance companies, to say, listen, how could we provide access to someone who's trained in palliative support, nurses and other social workers and chaplains, and provide this access, including 24-7 phone support, even in our most distant rural areas? And they tried some creative things and had some amazing solutions, and you can see some of them there. The caregiver support and that access to 24-7 is probably really critical. They talk about how important the partnerships are. So for people who want to learn more, I've put the resource down there so you can learn more about that. I want to end with just a brief discussion around advanced care planning. I don't need to show you a bunch of slides about how our country hasn't got a whole lot better with advanced care planning. By the way, there was one blip where the country got a lot better. You guys know when that was? Terry Schiavo, 2005. We had a blip. We almost doubled the number of people that had advanced directives. But for the most part, we haven't made a lot of progress. And notice that it's not just the directives. Most people report wanting to have conversations with their families and their doctors, but not having had those. So why have we made so little progress? Because lo and behold, if you've worked in medicine, you know that we've tried a lot of different interventions for two decades. And people would say, it seems like we should be making more progress than we are. So what are some of the reasons? And if we had more time, I'd let all of us talk about it. But here's some of them. Fear. We know that there's myths abound around there, around advanced care planning. Interestingly, I think the second one's really important. Um, I was talking with Charles earlier today. This idea of we're waiting for patients to come in and say, I want to talk about planning. I want to think about the future. Can you help me? And patients are often waiting for doctors to kind of start it because they think that there's this elephant in the room and they really can see why we probably should be talking about this, but I'm not sure why my doctor isn't, so he probably he or she probably has a reason. So everyone's waiting. Charles said, I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm just going to go talk to my doctor. And you know what he said? So my doctor was relieved. The doctor wanted to talk about it. So it's one of those things where one of the barriers is we've got to get through this cultural barrier of why it's so hard to initiate these conversations. The naivete, and when I say this, I, I sometimes see, well, that'll happen. That'll just happen when palliative care gets involved or when hospice gets involved. Advanced care planning should start when you're an adult, when you're healthy, and you should be thinking about it in the very early stages. So, we're naive to believe that palliative teams could ever do all of that type of work. And then short-sighted fixes. And this is where I want to spend a little bit of time. You guys actually today have done a fabulous job of talking about all the different barriers. They've come up all the time. But when you think about the process of planning, all the way to the point of where you might be critically ill and a decision has to be made on your behalf using those plans, imagine all the steps. So here I'm an engineer, so I create this slide. Because I started laying out the steps. You've got to think about it. 
you not only have to think about it, you have to kind of know what questions to ask. So you probably need some help about what questions you might want to be asking yourself. And lo and behold, your family and those that you love the most probably better be a part of this. Because we already heard stories where the family's not a part of it and they say, whoa, I never heard John say that. And then all of a sudden you're starting to derail the process. Then once you get there to the reflecting part, you need some way for the system to translate those values and beliefs into something that's going to be meaningful around decisions. You need to find a way to document it in one place so that across settings you know there's one place you go to get directives or there's one bracelet where my directives sit and everyone knows how to get to them. And they have to be very retrievable. In ERs and hospitals and nursing homes and other settings, notice that for this system to work, all of those pieces have to work. So interventions that target one little piece, like making a better conversation, or making a better document, or making it easier to extract a document, without all the other pieces in place, like a good conversation, you can see that you don't fix it. That the only way you're going to fix it is you have to address that whole system. There's very few places that have done that. But let's talk about some progress that's being made right now. So Ira referred to the conversation project. How many of you guys have been a part of a conversation project, gotten to see any of that? So no one's experienced it here. Oh, um, Carolyn has. Conversation project is a large effort. Um, Pulitzer Prize, Ellen Goodman, and her team, which includes Ira, have worked to say, how could we spark public dialogue around this very important thing called planning? And I'm not going to show you this video because I think we're running too tight on time. But this is one family's conversation. And if you go to that website, you can link to this very easily. And it's about five minutes. And you get a chance to see this family talking. And what I want you to take away from that is this is a family, much like our families, who decides, you know what, we're going to talk about this. We're going to start this conversation. And this, the website provides you a toolkit that helps to kind of start and to think through these conversations. But I want to send a very important message is starting the conversation and getting families to start talking about this is really important. But notice, it's one piece of that cog that I was talking about. But it's going to give you a better platform on which to start developing the plans around directives. So I want you to pay attention to this project. What they do is they go out to communities and they work with communities to give them these tools and to really spark this public dialogue. This community would be perfect. To, to, and I have no stock in the conversation project. I just think it's a really important project. Another one that I think is really critical is if you look across the United States, there's very few communities who have figured out how to do systematic advanced care planning and do it effectively. But one of them is in La Crosse County, Wisconsin. Some of you may have heard of La Crosse County, Wisconsin. A number of years ago, in the early 90s, they started a project called Respecting Choices. And the idea behind Respecting Choices is how could we create a model where we knew with confidence that people had the ability to reflect, to capture and express their values, that it could be kept somewhere across the county, whether you're in the nursing home or the hospital, wherever, easily accessible, and that people's values could be honored. Notice those statistics. I think it's 95% of the time now, if you die in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, you have an advanced directive. 99.5% of the time, it's found in one place across the whole county because everyone have agreed to use the same system. And nearly 100% of the time when they go back and look at the match, it's not 100% because you can imagine some people change their minds near the very end. But there's a, a match between what was documented as what a person wanted and what was actually delivered. Now what's important about this system to recognize is that they don't rely on physicians to start these conversations. They have embedded throughout their community people that are trained in how to have these conversations. There's nurses, there's social workers, there's some doctors, there's volunteers, there's people that work together across all settings to make sure that people have an access to various parts of these conversations so that it simply becomes part of the usual care that's delivered. I thought I'd share this slide um, mostly because I knew we'd be talking a little bit about DNR, but I found this very interesting. They've looked at their resuscitation attempts over the years, way back in the 90s when they started, to the present. And notice what you see is that the number of attempts now that occur in the hospital have gone down. But the ones that occur are far more likely to be successful. So what's happening there? People are more informed. They're making decisions around things that actually are more likely to in fact be successful. 
and they're not making decisions that potentially might lead to suffering that they don't want. So my last three slides are just to remind us. I've given you some ideas here. I think respecting choices in the conversation project are examples of where this community could take the amazing platform it has and start to move everything upstream by allowing people to have important conversations. Um, but we've got a lot of solutions. I heard a bunch of them today as I heard you guys talk. We have the ability to partner. This is really an important time where if we're clear about our why and we find how our whys align with each other, there's going to be natural collaborations, amazing opportunities to write incredible grants, to raise money around incredible ideas, new ideas that the country desperately needs, invest in systems, and when I say integrate and embed, my vision, and I'm trying to make this happen right now in my national role at Kaiser, is that if we have a mature system, someone may be facing really serious illness and have some really complex needs. And instead of getting referred, part of their team has some people on it that happen to be really good at palliative care. There's no exchange. You don't even have to talk about palliative care. They know it as Betty. She's really good at helping me and my family plan. Or John, who's helping me with my pain. And I'm so lucky to have the care that I have. That, to me, is a mature system. And the way we get there, I think, is through integration and embedding support. Finding ways to take people with special skill sets and making sure that they're automatically touching people that are really sick. And I want these communities, you guys, to think about that, because no one has figured this out yet. But if there's ever a place where we can start figuring this out, it's a place like this. I think we need to speak up. Ira and I were having um, a chat this morning about how both of us are frustrated that we think the field of hospice and palliative care has been way too quiet. That we should be speaking louder and we should have the public, all of you, speaking louder to say, why is hospice cuts occurring right now? Why are these things happening and, and everyone's just okay with this? We need to speak up because this is really important time to have our whys out in front of the public. And we need to be willing to take risk. And so that's where my last two slides are. So I'm blessed to be married to a music teacher. And my sons, all three of them, cut mom's jeans, thank God, when it comes to music. So two of my um, children play the piano, and the other one is a singer. And they're all fabulous. And they have great ears. And I'm just so proud of all of them. Um, but early on, I had to learn this lesson around um, mistakes. I was watching the music teacher as she was teaching my son. And I was trying to understand how she was teaching him. And you know, my own style around teaching, I was trying to figure out, you know, do I like that? What do I think about that? And I came across this book called The Perfect Wrong Note, Learning to Trust Your Musical Self. And it talked about the different styles of, of learning. But it made this very important point around mistakes. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. When I'm on clinical service, I'm making mistakes all the time. And they made the distinction between the careless mistake and then the honest mistake. The honest mistake is the part of us growing as humans. We're, of course we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make them all the way to the end of our life. But we usually make them out of a place of innocence, a place of just not knowing. And we took a little bit of risk. And oops, that didn't work so well. Careless mistake is when we become inattentive. They're ones that we spend a lot of time rationalizing. And there's a lot of guilt and blame that go with them. The difference between these mistakes is really important because what I can tell you is, of course, this community and all of our communities will continue to make mistakes. But what we have to do is work towards honest mistakes, learn quickly from those mistakes, and keep moving forward. And what's our compass? The why is our compass. That's why we need to keep why front and center. So I don't think I saw anyone sleeping or dozing or even with your eyes closed. So my thanks to all of you for your attention and your incredible energy all the way through the whole day. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this.